consist of your mind. Did you know that? And did you know the average person uses only 10% of his mind capabilities during his lifetime? So that means that you die with only having used 10% of your brain capabilities. I mean, no, yeah, 10%. Now, maybe you're saying, Susan, I thought this was, you know, is this a lesson on the human brain? No, it's not. But you know, in the beginning, God told Adam and Eve how they should think. And if they did what he said according to his commands and thought the way he asked them to and obey what he asked them to, then they would live happy, holy lives. But we know since the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, there's been a battle over who's going to control our mind, right? As well as our actions. So every day we battle. I mean, it's only 145. And I bet you today, many of you have had 100, if not 200, battles in your mind already with your fleshly thoughts and so we have a choice am I going to behave in the way I want to behave or am I going to behave and think in a way that God wants me to behave and so whether we want to admit it or not what we think greatly determines what kind of life we live my dear sister have you examined your thought life lately what goes through your brain every day well, the Apostle Paul is going to give us something to think about in this lesson. In fact, he's going to give us six wonderful virtues that we should be thinking about. And so with the Lord's help and with your cooperation, we're going to clean up our thought life, okay, and start thinking what we ought to be thinking. So let's look at Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Finally, brother, whenever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and heard and received, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, it's very interesting. We don't have time to cover the, the verses before, but Paul has just told them to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let the request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, would guard their hearts and their minds. And so he's just reminded them that having anxiety is not godly. We are to put that off. We are not to have anxious thoughts. We are not to be worried. But if we're going to put off anxiety, if we're going to put off worry then what are we going to put in our brain? What are we going to fill our mind with? And so it's very interesting. He's already told them what to put off, and now he tells them what to put on. So if I'm not going to put on anxious thoughts, then I need to put on correct thoughts. So here we are with these virtues of what we are supposed to be thinking. And you have an outline there before you. Very brief. Think what? Verse 8. And think why? Why am I supposed to think this way? Verse 9. So... Let's look at the six things we're to be thinking about. First of all, Paul says we're to think on whatever is true. We're to be thinking things that are true. This would mean anything that's true in thought, true in word, uh, true in action, true to being true to the nature of God. Obviously, the opposite would be thinking on anything that's false, dishonest. God is the author of truth. We are to think things that are sincere, genuine, and true. And ladies, one of the best things that you can think on that is true is this book right here, The Truth. The Truth. If you would spend your time memorizing, meditating, studying this book, you would have less difficulty with your thought life. You would begin to learn to dwell on things that are true because you would know God's truth. Now, the opposite of true is what? Lie. And who is the father of all lies? So if you're not thinking on things that are, that are true, you're thinking on things that are lies, and you're thinking like Satan. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Jesus says in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning because he does not stand for the truth. There is no truth in him. None. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is the father of it. So ladies, if you and I are not dwelling on things that are true, then we're dwelling on things that are lies, and they come from Satan. In fact, John MacArthur says this, during spiritual warfare, Satan primarily attacks your thinking and your emotions. If he can condition you to think and feel contrary to God's word, he's won a significant victory. 
That's why he attempts to fill your mind with lies, immorality, false doctrine, half-truths. He tries to blur the line between righteousness and sin by surrounding you with evil influences that increase your tolerance for sin. He clothes offensive sin in the blinding garment of entertainment. He puts it to music, masks it in humor to confuse you and deaden your spiritual senses. Satan wants to corrupt your emotions and draw you into sinful desires. Ladies, we as women, in my opinion, are Satan's number one primary gender attack. <laughs> because if he can get us thinking things that are not true, he's one. And you know why I say we're his number one probably more than men? Because women have a difficult time with their thought life. We're speculative, we're suspicious, we're nosy, we judge, we criticize. I think more so. Sometimes I'll say something to my husband, he'll say, I don't understand your thinking. Where did you get that thought? Or why would you even think that? Why would you even think that I think that about you? Well, because you didn't, you know. I said, Susan, I don't even think like that. Where'd you get that? <laughs> you know, our husband will say, you know, he's going to be there at some certain time and he doesn't show up. And so we've already got him dead and buried and we've already planned his funeral and we're crying. <laughs> you know? Or your child's 10 minutes late past his curfew and you think he's, you know, been in a horrible car crash and the same, and the same thing. We're not thinking on things that are true. Ladies, thoughts like these are a waste of time and they're not thinking on things that are true. It's a waste of time. And by the way, we're not only to think on things that are true, but Paul says in another place we're to speak things that are true. Did you know that? Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. In fact, someone, many people will say, Susan, I don't know how to confront this person. I, don't, I need to talk to my husband about this. I need to talk to my friend about this. I always say this, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Also, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 25, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor. Why? For we're members of each other. You know, ladies, we would do, we would do well to listen to how we, when someone asks a question, speak the truth. Don't. Don't cloak it in hypocrisy. Speak the truth. If they say, how are you doing today? Don't say fine if you're not fine. Sometimes I'd say, well, I'm partly cloudy today, you know. <laughs> and if they want to ask me more, they can ask me more. Or if, you know, someone says, you know, I surely missed you. I really missed you while you were gone. And if you didn't miss them, don't say that. Well, I missed you too. That's a lie. That's not speaking truth. Say, well, you know, I, I can't say I really missed you. I was so busy or whatever it was, you know, or I don't really care for you that much, so I didn't miss you. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to be mean, but that was a hard one for me. And the, one of the ladies that disciples me, she helped me with a gracious response because I said, quite frankly, I don't, I don't think about everybody back home when I'm gone. I don't have time to think about them. But ladies, we're to think things that are true. We're to speak things that are true. The second virtue Paul says we're to think on is whatever things are noble. This means, this word actually is interesting. It means reverent and dignified. Reverent and dignified. In fact, it's a quality of a deacon. A deacons are to be reverent. They're to be dignified. Um, so it would be something that was given honor. Um, so we could say it's, it's more like thinking on things that are worthy of our reverence or something that is dignified, someone that is honorable. Uh, things that are worthy of reputation, things that are respectable. And you know what? <clears throat> Our Lord is the one who deserves the most honor, the most respect of anyone, and yet I'm afraid that we are a nation that does not fear God. We don't even give thought to him. There is no fear of God before our eyes, and we're teaching our children the same thing. I'm so thankful for my dad who instilled the fear of God in me. And boy, I tried to instill that fear in my kids too. Ladies, we're to be thinking about that. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of respect. In fact, I think many times on the Lord's Day, we are not, our mind's not there. We're sitting in church or maybe even this weekend you've been here and, you know, we've been singing some great songs. Hopefully you've been listening to mediocre teaching. And, uh, you know, your mind's elsewhere. I wonder what my house is going to look like when I get home. I wonder if my husband removed my computer off my desk the way I hope he did. <laughs> I wonder if my house is intact, you know, or, or on Sunday morning, you know, instead of thinking about worship and the message that's being preached, we're, I'm thinking, well, you know, where's so-and-so? I wonder why they aren't here today. Or, um, you know, a while ago, I was really distracted. I don't know if you noticed the, well, I don't remember which lesson it was, but Debbie was out of the room half the time. And, 
And I thought, I wonder what's happened. Is she okay? You know, the last time I was here, she got a toothache. Do you guys remember that? Yes. And we were afraid for her to get on a plane. And so she had a severe. So I was like, where's Debbie? Where's she going? I'm sitting there. I got to focus on this lesson on contentment. What's happened? Is she okay? You know? And so we're sitting here in church and our minds are not focused on the one we're here to worship. Or we're planning our, you know, what we're going to have tomorrow for Mother's Day or if our kids are going to even remember us tomorrow. You know, or we're planning our week's activities. We're involved in daydreaming. Ladies, these thoughts are not noble. They're not reverent. When we should be focused on the one who saved us. Discipline your mind. Discipline your mind. Instead of, the, of using the opportunity to focus on the blessed Lord, we focus on thoughts that are not profitable for worship. <clears throat> in fact, when you're in church and you realize someone's not there, instead of wondering where they're at, why they're not there, pray for them. Lord, I don't know why they're not here today, but I just pray in whatever situation they're in, pray for them. And, you should focus on the music that's being sung, the sermon that's being preached. That's one of the reasons I, last week or a week before, Justin and his wife were there. They, go, they come to our church, and you know Justin has cerebral palsy, so they sit in the back, and they, we have a few tables in the back of our church. And Doug said, let's sit back here with Justin and Kathy today. And, of course, being the submissive wife I am, I did, but I don't like sitting in the back of the church because I can't concentrate. But... I honored my husband, and uh, it was a little distracting because we have this one family whose kids roll crayons all over the table. You know, you can hear the crayons rolling during the message. And uh, <clears throat> so I sit in the front. I sit about the second row from the front because I want to really focus in on what's being preached. I want to, so if that's a difficulty for you, if you're distracted, move up to the front. We are to be thinking on things that are reverent, noble. The third virtue that's to be in our minds is we're to think things that are just. This means we're to think on things that are right, righteous, things that are right and righteous by divine standards and human standards. This would be the opposite of the evil man in Psalm 36, 4, who plots evil in his bed at night so that he can carry it out the next day. <laughs> I'm telling you, some of the things that I read in the news are just distressing to me. Are they to you? decapitating people's heads and I mean it's just like who thinks of this stuff what kind of an evil person thinks about these kinds of things ladies for Christian we are to be thinking on things that are just and righteous so instead of going to bed at night and thinking how I can plot evil or revenge I think about how I can do something which is right or godly for someone else if someone does wrong to you instead of thinking how I can pay him back I think about how I can bless them so I can heap coals of fire on their head. No, not really. That. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. You heap coals of fire on their head, probably from the guilt. Well, the fourth quality, food for your brain, is thinking on things, Paul says, that are pure. This means we must think on what is chaste, innocent, holy, that which is not mixed with moral impurity, things that are separate, things that are clean, we're not to think on things that are dirty or things that defile our minds. And ladies, this is a challenge. Oh, my. I, I don't know. You know, sometimes I think we should throw all televisions in the deep ocean. Because even if you do want to watch something on television, there's, there's a commercial will flash before your eyes, and you've seen something immoral or impure that you had no intention of seeing. Just recently, I think I've, I've told you about Victoria's Secrets, and I, you know, that, that whole thing disgusted me at the mall, and, and I wrote them a letter about the pornography, their pornographic windows. I know Christians now that won't even go to the mall because of the storefronts of the windows, not just Victoria's Secrets, but the bed and bath and body shop, and I remember ta one time going there recently, and there was a man standing completely naked as, on a poster, and all he had was a watermelon thing in front of his, you know what? And I'm like, really? I, I, you know... And I don't go to the mall to go shopping. I go there to walk sometimes. And so um, I just really, but the, la the last thing really did me in. And this was at a makeup store. And I can't remember the makeup store, Sephora, whatever it is we have in our mall. And I was walking with my friend. And um, it was a woman in bed with a dog. And I said, that's it. I've had enough. I, I mean, I just got living. And she goes, it's okay. Just don't look. And I said, what do you mean don't look? This is, I don't have to put up with this. And I was, so I wrote him a letter. Of course, I never heard back from him. I could not believe it. I could not believe it. Beastality right there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, which is supposed to be one of the most conservative states, the Bible Belt. So, ladies, we have a challenge before us to keep our minds pure because of 
television, because of the internet, because every one of you in here, probably, uh, every one of you in here probably has a smartphone or an iPhone. And so the availability of you looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at is just, is just right there. Ladies, you would do well to be very, very careful and guard the eyes of yourself and your children. In fact, one man says, a, com a computer buff, he said, garbage in, garbage out. You know, that's really a principle of life. So if you're filling your mind with wrong viewing on television, movies, sometimes somebody will say, well, you got to go see this movie. I, well, first of all, I hardly ever go to a movie. But you got, really, will, so I'll get online, and my daughter's giving me a website that's good that I can check out. And I'm like, I don't think so. Let's see, there's sex, there's this, there's no. I don't think I'm going to go see that movie. No, thank you. Ladies, we should have the heart of the psalmist in Psalm 101. I'm getting ready to teach this on the radio when I'm in India, so you can tune in to great psalm. He says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no evil thing before my eye. That was David's desire. That should be our desire. In fact, I know a woman who put this over her television. I will set no evil thing before my eye. Maybe that should be your, your front page on your iPhone <laughs> and your husband's too. Ladies, if you watch a lot of inappropriate television and you do a lot of internet surfing that's inappropriate, don't be surprised if you struggle with wrong thinking. In fact, they tell us the average male watches 26 hours of television a week and the average female watches 30 hours a week. Now, if you are one of those females, I want you to come talk to me because I, I don't have 30 hours. <laughs> are you serious? 30 hours? And, and then if I did, what, what would be worth 30 hours of my time on television? I don't know what it would be. In fact, the average high school student spends more time in front of the television in his lifetime than the sum total spent before a teacher from kindergarten through high school. And now, you know, it's the iPhones, you know. We, we, put them, we take them from the pacifier to an iPad. Here, honey, give me that pacifier. Now, here's your iPad. And, you know, I mean, I'll go to restaurants now. I'm just shocked. You know, families no longer visit husbands and wives. They're both doing this. You know, I'm like, well, that must be a great marriage. They also tell us pornographic websites are the number one engine searched on the website. Number one. I know this is sad to say, but I know Christians that know what's on television tonight, but they can't tell me where the simplest things are in God's word. In fact, they'll tell me, have you seen, you know, have you heard of such and such actress? You know, she got divorced. I go, oh, I'm sorry. I don't even know who you're talking about. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I don't know these people. Ladies, if you struggle with impure thoughts, I would challenge you to calculate how much time you're spending with wrong input into your mind. Garbage in, garbage out. What you think is what you are. Well, the fifth virtue that Paul says we're to think on are things that are lovely. Lovely. The word lovely means what's dear to anyone, what's pleasing. We're to think on things that are beautiful in character. Uh, think on love, friendship. We're to replace ugly, selfish, arrogant thoughts with what is lovely. You know, take, you ever take time to think about those that you love and the good memories you've made? You know, tomorrow's Mother's Day, and my mom's been gone now about six years, and I've been thinking about her and the good things that she left for me, the memories I have with her. That's a good thing to think about. That's something lovely. Take some time. Think about God's creation. You ever just sit outside and watch the birds or... You know, look at the flowers. That's something lovely. Think about that. Think about creation, the fact that you get to see. I have a, a girl I'm mentoring right now. She's going blind, only 40 years of age, and she's going blind. One of these days, she's not going to be able to see at all. You know, we should think on those things. If I were a betting woman, which I'm not, I would bet that lovely women have lovely thought lives, and crabby women have crabby thought lives, ugly thought lives. Think about it. Well, only think about it if it's lovely. The final and sixth virtue that we're to think on are things of good report. This means that which is fair sounding, well spoken of, reputable. This relates to what is positive and constructive rather than negative and destructive. So instead of thinking bad reports about people and criticizing them, we must think good reports about people and speak well of them. Now, this does not mean we speak and think things that are not true. You know, if someone's really done something bad, that's really true. <laughs> but it does mean we don't dwell on the negative. I, this is a quality of my husband that I wish I had. He thinks the best of everyone. And I'm like, really? 
course, I'm the opposite. You know, I think the worst of everyone, so I guess we make a good team, but not really. I need to be more like him. He thinks the best of everyone. And sometimes he just amazes me. I go, how do you do that? And by the way, we must also stop those who would be giving bad reports or gossiping. Receiving a bad report is not honoring to the Lord. It's the same as giving it. In fact, I've learned as a counselor, it's a fool that answers a matter before he hears it. A lot of times women will come in, they'll share with me all their problems about their husband. And I'm like, man, you must be married to the Antichrist. I mean, he must be, you know, Charles Manson or something. And then you know what? I've, I've learned over the years of counseling. How about you and your husband come in and talk to me and my husband together? Then you hear another side of the story. So she looks like the Antichrist, you know? So I'm also I'm all learning now to not, not, I hear everything she says, but I don't believe everything she says, because there's always another side to the story, you know? So we're to think on things that are good, good report. Well, these six thoughts that are described by Paul, there he describes them as virtuous and praiseworthy, because notice what he says, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, worthy, meditate on these things. Now, when Paul uses the word virtue, he's referring to moral excellence or that which is pleasing to God. So what Paul's saying is, it's not just these six things, these qualities that you should think about, but if there's anything else that is virtuous, if there's anything else that is praiseworthy, think on that too. So that would include a lot of things. Anything that's commendable, anything that's worthy of praise, anything that's virtuous, we should think on that too. Ladies, there's a lot of things we can think about. A lot of things we can put in our mind that are virtuous, that are praiseworthy. I mean, sit out at night and look at the stars and meditate or, you know, think about this weekend and maybe some new friends you've made this weekend or how you've been challenged spiritually. Those are, those are things that are virtuous. Those are things that are praiseworthy. Think about the great food you had. I didn't have any lunch, but I mean, I had a banana and some peanuts from Southwest Airlines, but, um, you know, I don't know. What, was your lunch good? Okay, think about that, you know, the food that God provided for you. So Paul says, if there's anything else that's virtuous or praiseworthy, think on that. Think on the friendships you've made. And certainly anything that's related to our Lord and his precious word would be worthy of thinking on. So thinking on these six virtues would indeed, what, bring praise and glory to the Lord. The opposite brings grief and shame to him. And notice these six virtues concerning them. Paul says we're to meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Think on these things. Give weight to these things. This is what you should be thinking about. Ladies, our minds should dwell on these at all times. So this brings me to a question. Have you examined your thought life lately? You might say, no. <laughs> if you're having a problem with peace, if you're having a problem with joy, you might stop and ask yourself, am I thinking on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of good report? It's been said you cannot prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest in your hair. Right? So it is with wrong thoughts. Ladies, you can't prevent them from coming into your mind. We are going to have wrong thoughts come in our mind. But you don't have to let them nest there, to stay there. If you do, it'll rob you of your peace and joy. In fact, one of my mentors, the same one, with the jewelry and the southern accent, she said her teacher, which was eons ago, which was Kay Arthur, would say this, you are to Philippians 4, 8, every thought before you invite it for tea. It's a good thing. You are to Philippians 4, 8, every thought before you invite it for tea. This would be a good habit for all of us to get into. So, now that we know what we are to think, we end with why. Why should I think this way? I mean, I kind of like thinking evil thoughts. I kind of like thinking sexual thoughts. No, 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 no. Paul says, think this other way, and why? Why? Notice what he says. These things which you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. So the question comes to mind, what are the things Paul's talking about? These things, the things. Those six virtues. Paul says, you've learned them from me, you heard them from me, and you have seen them in me. Ladies, this is a wonderful commentary on the Apostle Paul. He preaches, he practices what he preaches. He says, you've seen me, 
behave like this because I think like this. You've learned these things from me, and you've heard it. So, what is the church at Philippi supposed to do with all they've learned, received, and heard, and saw in Paul concerning all these virtues? Are they to chalk it up for another interesting sermon by the Apostle Paul? Should they tell it to their spouse in hopes that he will get it? Are they to file it in their spiritual file? No. Notice what Paul says. Those things that you've learned, heard, and received, do. Do it. Do these things. In fact, do is a Greek word which means perform it. Practice it. Ladies, this is imperative. You have heard five messages now this weekend, but now you've got the responsibility to go and what? Do. Do the word. Do what God says. James 1, says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man, beholding his natural face in a mirror. He sees himself, goes his way, and forgets what manner of person he is. But he that looks intently to the law of liberty, what? And continues in it, this one is blessed in all he does. Ladies, you didn't come this weekend to audit the women's conference, okay? You're not auditing a class. You got to go out now and do the homework. You got to do it. Hearing without doing is deceiving yourself. But notice there's a blessing in the doing here, according to Paul, what he says in Philippians. He says, the God of peace will be with you. Ladies, this is Paul's answer to, why should I think this way, Paul? Why? If you think in a way that pleases God, the God of peace will be with you. You will be at peace. Ladies, I want him to be with me. I want God's peace, and I want him to be with me. There's nothing as satisfying and as enriching as having the peace of God rule in your heart, so nothing can disturb it. But if you're thinking wrong, if you're worrying, if you're fretting, if you're thinking evil thoughts, if you're having sexual thoughts, you will not have the peace of God. That's why that pastor's wife couldn't look me in the face the last two conferences. I didn't know she was committing adultery. I knew something was up, but she didn't have the peace of God. There's no peace in her life. Ladies, he's the God of peace and the giver of peace. Peace is rest, and it's in contrast with strife. My mom's favorite verse that I would often hear her stand up and quote in church that we have engraved on her tombstone, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusted. in you, thou, will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. Ladies, you want peace, you want joy, keep your mind where it ought to be. So what are we to think? We're to think on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Why are we to think this way? So the God of peace will be with us. So what about you? <clears throat> what are you thinking about? Do you dwell on things that Paul mentions in verse 8? Or is your mind clouded by things that are not true, not noble, not just, not pure, not lovely, not of good report? By way of closing, I want to give you three practical suggestions on how to help you clean up your thought life. <clears throat> First of all, ask yourself honestly, what am I feeding my mind? Carefully examine your input. Even keep a journal. Maybe start tomorrow. Keep a journal of the things you read, you watch, magazines you look at, how much time you spend doing those things. Then after you take care of what you're feeding your mind, secondly, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In fact, the word captive is a military term referring to a military conquest. We are to seize any thought. So I have a thought come into my mind. You know, maybe unrighteous about my, you know, I wish he would, I wish my husband would think that of me because I really got to make those copies tomorrow, you know. So is that a right thought? No. No. So I seize that thought, I take it captive, that's ungodly, and I smash it. That's the whole idea. You smash it. 
Say, I'm going to start thinking about him. He's at home. He's got an arm. He can't use his arm. He's got an arm impingement. So he's only one use of one arm. In fact, I just talked to him during the break, and he said he was so nauseated because he is in so much pain because he lifted all that stuff off my desk. And then I felt like a heel, you know. That's probably how the Lord wants me to feel, like a heel. So you, you smash that thought, and you take it captive into the obedience of Christ. Is this true? If not, demolish it. Is this an honest thought? If not, demolish it. If it's, is this a lovely thought? If not, smash it. So watch your, what you're putting in your mind. Secondly, when those thoughts come through your mind, smash them. And ladies, that's where God's word comes in so wonderfully. And that's the third thing you must do is renew your mind with God's word. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by what? Renewing your mind. The more you saturate your mind with God's word, the more you'll be able to control your thinking and behavior. And again, you're probably sick of me saying this, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance of memorizing God's word. It will help you avoid dwelling on unpleasant or wrong thoughts and train you in how to renew your mind to think biblically. My sisters, think on things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, and the God of peace will be with you and joy will fill your heart. Now, let me say one more thing before we close, and that is this. <clears throat> None of these lessons that we have had this weekend will make any sense to you at all. They won't change your life at all if you do not have supernatural power to change. If you do not have God's spirit within you, you're hopeless. But if you had made that commitment to believe that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures and you have committed your life to his lordship, in other words, he is now your master, you are not the owner of your life, you have submitted your life completely to him, repented of your sins, then he will help you, his spirit will help you to do these things that we've looked at this weekend. So, how fares it with you, dear sister? Are you a woman whose life exhibits joy because you're known as a woman of prayer, as we saw last night? Are you a woman whose life exhibits joy because you are a woman who is humble? Are you a woman whose life exhibits joy because you are a woman who is content? Are you a woman whose life exhibits joy because you are a woman who presses on and on and on? <laughs> are you a woman whose life exhibits joy because your thought life is godly and under control? I pray that you are. Let's close. Father, thank you for this weekend. Thank you for these ladies. Thank you for their kindness to me, their graciousness, their generosity, their love for one another, their love for your word, their love for truth and purity. And Father, I pray for them. I pray for this church, Lord, that you would protect it, that you would keep it from evil and from the evil one that wants to devour and destroy it. I pray, oh God, that you would protect the leadership. I pray that you would protect the, the leadership wives. I pray that you would keep them from evil and the evil one. And Father, I pray that these ladies would take these things that we have studied this weekend and not file them away and get busy with Mother's Day and the week ahead that lies before them. But Father, they would really think on these things that we have studied and really begin with the power and help of your Holy Spirit to put off wrong behavior and wrong thinking and put on what is right. And Father, all of this, not for any pat on our back or that we would be exalted in any way, but that Christ would be exalted in our lives and he would be the one that is worshiped and praised for you are the only one that is holy and only one that is worthy. In Jesus, your son's name I pray. Amen.